All right. Uh, Joe and I welcome the opportunity to talk to uh, the Bar Association about the prosecution of John DuPont. Uh, DuPont murdered uh, Olympic gold medal wrestler Dave Schultz in late January of 1996. Uh, Joe had just uh, started as first assistant in the district attorney's office. Pat Meehan had just started uh, three weeks earlier as the district attorney, and they were uh, certainly uh, thrust into that situation. Um, there's really uh, kind of three stages that Joe and I will talk about in the case. The, the first is the, uh, the murder uh, and the standoff of 48 hours where DuPont uh, was holed up in his mansion refusing to surrender. The second are the pretrial activities, which were very, very extensive, uh, over 80 pretrial appeals to the Superior Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, and uh, in the trial court, and then uh, the trial, which uh, was uh, certainly one of, if not the longest in Delaware County history, where it was uh, a month and then the jury was out for uh, a week. So j just starting off real quickly, even though I was not involved in the case at the outset like Joe, I came in uh, several weeks later because of all the motions that were being filed uh, by DuPont's uh, extensive defense team. I, I was certainly very familiar with the uh, with the shooting and with the, uh, the the standoff. I just want to talk briefly about the circumstances of uh, uh, the ap the immediate aftermath of the murder and the the uh, immediate standoff, and then Joe can talk about the negotiations to try to get Dupont out of his mansion. So uh, Dupont approached Dave Schultz outside of Dave Schultz's house said, uh, do you have a problem with me? As Dave Schultz uh, was exiting his car and uh, shot him and then stood over his body and shot him again uh, in uh, the full view of uh, Nancy Schultz, Dave's uh, now widow. Um, and uh, something that always made it a real impact on me is that uh, once DuPont fled the scene and Nancy Schultz called 911, the first officer on the scene was Steve Shallis, who was a patrolman in Newtown Township, uh, where the murder took place. Uh, Steve knew Dave Schultz and knew the family. Uh, so it was, you know, I, I think, particularly hard for him. And he immediately tries to give whatever first aid he could to Dave, but then had the presence of mind, which I found amazing, to yell to Nancy because the, the shooting happened. Uh, right as school was letting out uh, and the, uh, the Schultzes had two young children at elementary school who would be on the bus and the first stop of that bus was at the Schultz house. Uh, but uh, Steve Shallis uh, yelled to Nancy, call the school, tell them not to let the bus come here uh, because you can imagine what that would have been like not only for the, the Schultz children but a bus filled with uh, kids uh, coming upon a murder scene. Uh, which I just found incredible that Steve had the presence of mind to do that. The uh, uh, other paramedics arrived. Steve went to the, uh, the, the gate of the huge estate that DuPont had, briefed the chief of police, who then kept watch at the, uh, at the gate. And Steve Shallis drove into the uh, compound where he hid behind a tree, keeping a watch on DuPont, going from room to room in this huge mansion, looking out the window. Uh, DuPont had weapons that could kill a man at a mile. He had a cache of weapons that were incredible, and I, I'm sure Joe can talk some about that too. But Steve Shallis, for two hours while a SWAT team was being put together, was the lone person watching DuPont and making sure he didn't escape from the mansion. And as staff would leave the mansion, Shallis would run out in the open, grab them, take them down a hill to safety because they didn't know who DuPont might shoot next. So, you know, what, what he accomplished that day has always stayed with me. And, uh, uh, the, you know, his, his foresight and his bravery that day, of putting himself in, you know, the line of fire and, and doing what had to be done really made an impact on me. And, and then, Joe, you can... Uh, pick up, if you don't mind, in terms of the negotiations to try to get DuPont out of his house. Well, uh, when this occurred, I was on my way to Harrisburg, actually, to give a speech. And uh, 
when I got there, I was informed of what had occurred. And that element of Delaware County was still new to me. I didn't know the nature of the DuPont estate, but I was quickly informed that I came right back after that. And Pat Mann and I were at the, uh, the command post uh, for the majority of the time that DuPont was a barricaded man. But uh, the largest part of the running the operations, Pat was a very calm presence, particularly for someone who hadn't been in law enforcement for a while. Uh, most of our conduct of, it, during a barricade uh, situation was, consisted of saying, let's not do that because there was some, a variety of different relatively high risk or uh, uh, difficult operations planned to extract him. But most of, the most important person there probably for that time was, was Kevin Kelly, uh, now Judge Kelly, I believe. Uh, Kevin um, it, it quickly liaison with all the police uh, he arranged, we, we were recording the telephone conversations that DuPont was having. We had arranged, and I think Kevin set this up too, so that when DuPont picked up his phone, uh, it would only ring the command post, so he'd have to speak to us. He wanted to speak to his lawyer. He claimed diplomatic or royalty immunity as a member of the Bulgarian uh, hierarchy, claimed he was Bulgarian. And he would talk to uh, Taris Wochuk, Terry Wochuk, who was his lawyer. But we were recording that. Uh, we were finding out what was going on. Meanwhile, there were other efforts made to kind of force him out. We're turning off of the heat in his building, his mansion. It was, it was in January. It was cold. Uh, again, he could communicate with no one. His staff had exited, and he was incapable of fending for himself. I don't think he could even make a sandwich. So he was kind of stuck. Uh, and this was very good. But the bad part of it was he was stuck with uh, a cache of arms, which were very uh, alarming. He had long guns, he had scoped rifles, handguns. Uh, I believe he had a street sweeper. He, he had weapons which could cause a great deal of damage. In addition, we knew that he had ordered a 50 caliber machine gun. We didn't know if he'd received it yet. He had gotten a permit to, to have this uh, to place on top of another item which he had, which was an armored personnel carrier. Uh, which is also, if he had uh, a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on an armored personnel carrier, the amount of carnage he could have caused would have been inestimable. Um, fortunately, we were able to dis disable his armored personnel carrier, where we found 2,000 rounds of ammunition, but no machine gun. It hadn't arrived yet. Then after about, it was close to, I think it was about between 36 and 48 hours, the negotiations were ongoing. He was tiring. He was cold. He was burning books in his fireplace. Uh, his book, interestingly enough, was titled Code Ghost Written. It was called Never Give Up. Uh, so uh, he was in there and, and he began, we would shift, switch negotiators. And one of them was a, a young police officer from Upper Darby by the name of uh, Anthony Paparo. And uh, Anthony Paparo, um, Mr. DuPont wished to go outside of the mansion and go to his Buddha statue, I think. And he had a Buddha statue that he wanted to go out and pay his respects to. And Anthony uh, Paparo, Officer Paparo, explained to him that, well, I don't know if that's permissible. I think it is. He said, why don't you do that? And when you come back, we can discuss turning the heat back on and allowing you to have, and, and having further negotiations. And merely the reference to uh, when you return, apparently persuaded DuPont that he was going to be permitted to leave and return. Now, of course, Officer Paris said, don't bring any weapons outside with you. That will be scary, don't, don't do that. So DuPont left his mansion, uh, which we had eyes on all, all around. He saw, uh, he was headed towards a statue and uh, they put the dogs on him. They put a dog on him, the dog brought him to the ground. Police officers intervened, took him into custody. And uh, from there, he was taken to the police station. So it, it, there were, were, was a great deal of personnel involved and a great deal of uh, concern, uh, but the standoff ended without harm to anyone, uh, even DuPont. So that was a, a good thing. And again, much of that was done uh, through the, uh, uh, the, the, good, the good work done by, by Kevin Kelly, who liaised between a variety of different police departments. They were all there because they all had members of the SWAT team uh, who responded to the standoff. So each of them had a, 
officer. They had many chiefs there. They were all talking about things they wanted to do. And as I said, Pat Meehan uh, was a calming presence, and Kevin kept a good liaison with all these people until Dupont was taken into custody. So uh, it was it was a very a stressful time, obviously, and it was it was tragic too because all this was in the aftermath of David Schultz, you know, being murdered in front of his wife and his body him laying there for a while before he could be recovered. Dennis, you were thinking of something. No, I was just thinking how, you know, he was uh, then transported to Delaware County Prison where he refused to take the medical exams and therefore was placed in the infirmary really for the entire time that he was at Delaware County. Um, and he uh, went on an alleged hunger strike uh, where he's purportedly only uh, took tea and Tylenol and uh, yet somehow gained 13 pounds while he was on a hunger strike because uh, food was being secreted into the prison. There, uh, the, the, those were before the days of intensive um, searching of people, including, you know, counsel and, and their staff going into the uh, into the, the prison. So DuPont gained 13 pounds on a hunger strike. Uh, and it actually, at some of the pretrial hearings, it was amusing to hear the prison nurses describe uh, uh, DuPont going under the table and they would smell hamburgers and uh, he would come out from under the table and his cheeks would be bulging and his mouth would be going up and down. Uh, well, so the other interesting thing about the pretrial, Denison, and uh, I'm not sure if, if I actually made the call during the standoff or, or after he was taken into custody, but it was immediately evident to everyone, including Terry Wojcik and me, that this was going to be a mental health defense, an insanity defense. In fact, I was thinking last night about this because I had tried to call Bob Sadoff, um, Dr. Sadoff, who was a forensic psychiatrist uh, in Philadelphia with whom I'd worked on previous mental health cases, and I got through to him. And Bob had already been retained uh, by Terry Wojcik, DuPont, and Sprague. Uh, so that's when I called uh, Park Dietz, who, who became our initial expert. Uh, so that it was immediately evident this, this case was not going to be a case of who shot David Schultz, but what excuse he might present. And it was immediately obvious um, that it was going to be a mental health defense. In addition, um, most prosecutors, most people don't deal with most lawyers don't deal with insanity defenses in murder cases very frequently, but this was one where it was clearly in play from the, from the first moment. And it was one where the defendant murderer had such a well-documented history of bizarre behavior that it was going to be a, a, a viable defense. That was my opinion early on. And I think yours as well. And then what happened next? And I'll, give a bit of a preamble to the pretrial and then, then I'll throw it over to you then, is that the DuPont hired a, 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 a bevy of lawyers almost immediately with Terry, Woj Terry Wojcik hired them. And it became evident to me that it was not going to be a case that could be done without someone with great expertise in the pretrial and emotion practice and also with mental health uh, legal understanding. And that was Dennis. Uh, Pat Mann and I discussed that. Pat suggested immediately Dennis, and I immediately agreed. And we went to Dennis, and I'll leave it to you to to, to describe whether you declined once, twice, or or, or accepted immediately. Then I'll I'll, I'll I'll let your recollection control. But I, I will say before I, I turn it over that that was the critical element of the case was having Dennis involved to deal with the pre, both the pretrial motion practice and with the mental health element of it, which was Dennis's uh, area of complete expertise. So with that in mind, Dennis, about two weeks after, I think two or three weeks after the, the arrest, the murder and the arrest, uh, Dennis rejoined the office, which he had left about six months earlier to go into private practice. I think I'm right, then. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, initially, you know, I had at that point a pretty active defense practice, had a, uh, quite a number of defense cases, even after six months and, you know, I had four young children and uh, I knew because of, you know, the, the pretrial practice that had already occurred and, and how Richard Sprague uses uh, pretrial practice that it was going to be 
pretrial hand-to-hand combat. And it, it was that and more. And so, yeah, the first uh, uh, request, I, I said, look, I just can't do that. I can't, I can't do it. And Joe and Pat, me, and after a day or two came back and I, I said, let me think about it. And I don't know if I've ever even told Joe this, a, a real good friend of mine, a classmate, uh, Tommy Garrickle, who's a, a lawyer, Reed Smith and City, and a very, very good lawyer. You know, I asked his advice and he said, look, it's a once in a lifetime case. And, you know, you're never going to get a chance to work on a case like this again. And then he said, uh, are you afraid of Dick Sprague? And that, that kind of got my Irish up a little bit. And I remember saying to him, I'm not afraid of him, but I'm afraid of what his practice can do to my life. Uh, but at that point, I thought, well, you know, hey, uh, Joe said, how long could it take? You know, six months? Well, it took a year and a half, but, <laughs> you know, be that as it may. Uh, decided to do it. And I do remember, you know, my kids had been watching the t- it was on TV every night. And I came home and said, look, I was going to work on the case with Joe. And I remember uh, my older kids applauding. They were like happy that <laughs> I was going to do it. So, so Dennis, you, you haven't told me then, then my threats to you, against you had nothing to do with your decision. Is that it? <laughs> they, they, they helped. They helped. Uh, <laughs> but so, you know, uh, kind of talking about the pretrial, it, the, the thing that you know, after these 25 years or so, that really comes back to me about this case and, and the pretrial aspect of it is that nothing was typical. I mean, there it, arraignment was not typical. Preliminary hearing wasn't uh, typical. Uh, we had a bail hearing that took a full day. You know, as you know, people who do bail hearings know it, they're usually about five minutes. But we, you know, we had a complete bail hearing. Joe and myself and Captain McKenna uh, went to the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital where DuPont was trying to get released to. He was trying to get released from prison to uh, the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital. And uh, we walked around to try to see what the security was there because, you know, DuPont's mansion had guns. He was actually a pilot. He, he had a helicopter that he piloted. He had uh, uh, um, uh, very strong relationships with people in Bulgaria. We knew that times that he had gone to Bulgaria with his wrestling team that he had created on his, his estate, he was actually greeted by the president of Bulgaria. And everything that DuPont said and all his crazy things that he did, they always had a grain of truth. And where he would be talking about diplomatic immunity uh, from Bulgaria, well, he had contacts and had given so much money to people in Bulgaria that we were concerned they might actually say he had some sort of diplomatic status. And now, I, I, a diplomatic status doesn't excuse you from murder, but it would certainly, you know, uh, gum up the gears for a while. Well, he, so, he had access. Uh, he had access to a jet as well, which he used frequently. In addition to that, I'm reminded of the uh, the visit to the institute. Didn't didn't someone call you doctor as you were walking around the institute? Yeah, that, yeah, so Joe, Captain McKenna, and I were there for at least an hour walking around the entire grounds, going right up to the unit where he said he wanted to go to. And the only people that ever uh, uh, said anything to us was, yeah, somebody looked at me and said, good morning, doctor. <laughs> so uh, we were able to show it didn't have the necessary security at the bail hearing. But, you know, and then at arraignment, which again, people who do defense work or prosecution work know that that's just a hand up of papers. Well, you know, it, it became an entirely different uh, scenario where uh, Dick Sprague wanted to talk about, that started questioning DuPont uh, about, you know, what's your name? He said, you know, uh, who are you? I'm the Dalai Lama. And, and going through things to make him look crazy. They were trying the case in the press or the jury pool. He grew his hair long. He grew a long beard. He, he constantly was trying to look crazy on TV or in the press reports. And by the way, that we believe that their theory of the case was to have DuPont declared incompetent to stand trial, refuse medication, which was permitted under Pennsylvania law at the time, and there were very, very little known uh, Pennsylvania regulation, uh, keep him incompetent get him bail to go to uh, either the Institute or back to his mansion. And uh, so long as he was incompetent to stand trial, he couldn't be tried. And there is a body of law that indicates that if you are incompetent to stand trial and can 
be found never to um, uh, become competent to stand trial that the charges can be dismissed. So, you know, we were very, very concerned about this process, very concerned about competency. And then we had a two day long competency hearing in, uh, in September of uh, uh, 1996 where the, their psychiatrists and our psychiatrists, Dr. Uh, O'Brien, Dr. Dietz testified, un, well, Dr. Dietz did not testify. Unfortunately, at that point, because DuPont uh, would not participate in a psychiatric evaluation, only the defense really had the opportunity to evaluate him and our doctors did not. They had a long tape of DuPont talking crazy about himself and about the, the Nazis. Uh, Nazis and Russians and conspiracies. Uh, to me and to Joe, we felt it was all staged. Uh, and, uh, you know, DuPont, we knew, was still doing financial dealings, financial trades, was still managing his estate, ordering people what to do at the estate and, and, and uh, uh, dealing with his vast uh, holdings, which we estimated at about $400 million, which made him the richest murderer in American history. Yeah, I, again, I think you've already articulated, but, but the, uh, the, short, the shorter version is their theory was they would keep him from going to trial on the merits mm -hmm. based upon his incompetency, drag it out, get bail, get him to his palatial estate, where he could live as he chose for as long as he wished until, you know, it, it, like in an old movie, eh, this will all blow over, you know? And, and, but the problem was with a person who's worth the better part of a billion dollars, they might succeed in that. And Dennis uh, saw that immediately, that that was their, their strategy. Incompetency, stretch it out, bail, access, living on the estate, access to the rest of the world if he chose to, to leave, to, to, to jump bail. And, and that was the critical element of the pretrial that Dennis saw. And we were fortunate with Judge Jenkins, and you can talk about this then, but Judge Jenkins did not want to permit any dilatory tactics. She wanted to, this case to proceed, and he wasn't going to be treated any more specially than circumstances merited, not because of his own demands. He was kept essentially, in, I think he was one celled at the correctional facility but I hope you'll mention then how many how many motion, pretrial motions there were actually. Yeah, there were uh, about eighty pretrial motions or pretrial appeals to the appellate courts, and so we were constantly responding. And, and th I remember there was one day where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court gave us twenty four hours to respond to a motion that was probably thirty pages long, and uh, it, uh, it, you know it was it was on such a fast track. And they were also using this uh, Supreme Court's uh, process whereby a single justice would be deciding pretrial motions. And uh, uh, we would constantly be asking that it be referred to the full court uh, because we knew that we'd have a, a, a much better chance with the full court. And fortunately, I think most of the time that happened. Uh, just going back to the arraignment one, one quick second when uh, Dick Sprague got done a asking questions of DuPont, you know, we said to Judge Jenkins, well, we'd like to colloquy the defendant too. And uh, Dick Sprague, oh no, you don't get a chance to ask. And Judge Jenkins said, well, why not? <laughs> you just you just asked a bunch of questions. They can ask follow-up questions. So Joe and I are both surprised that it happened. And we're like kind of maneuvering. Do you want to ask him? Do you want to ask him? And finally, I, I, I kind of nudged Joe and said, please let me do it. So uh, he did. And it was interesting because DuPont, while he wanted to look crazy, also didn't want to look stupid. And, it, you know, he had an ego, a very big ego. So when I started asking him questions, he's answering them appropriately. I said, well, your name is John DuPont, isn't it? Yes. And you're currently housed in Delaware County Prison. Yes. And you understand you're charged with murder, don't you? Yes. And, you know, the jury box over there is where people will sit in judgment. And that's Judge Jenkins, all of which are questions that you ask someone to determine whether they understand, whether they're competent, whether they understand the legal proceedings and cooperate with counsel. Like, These are your attorneys, right? They're the people who are going to help you. And, and finally, he started, he, he abruptly said, me no understand. And he stopped. And the sheriffs later told us that one of the attorneys 
had uh, had uh, said to him, just say you don't understand. Uh, we didn't hear that, but one of the sheriffs later came to us and told us that, and that became part of the competency proceedings to show, hey, look, he can cooperate with counsel. <laughs> they gave him instructions, and then he followed them. But so then didn't we they had later the claim. Did they later claim that they didn't say don't say you don't understand, but they had said something in, in Bulgarian? Uh, that actually was when when Dupont was brought in for the. Uh, examination by Judge Jenkins, court-appointed psychiatrist, Dr. Dietz from us, and the defense psychiatrist. He was being let in, uh, and uh, uh, the deputy warden was behind them, and uh, uh, deputy warden later told us that he heard DuPont instructed, uh, you don't even know your name. Right. And then when DuPont was asked, he did. he just said nothing and didn't even respond to his name, Deputy Warden, you know, came to us later and said, look, this is what happened. And so we introduced that to show again that he was able to cooperate with counsel. And counsel then subsequently wrote a letter to Judge Jenkins saying that, no, uh, DuPont, I did not tell DuPont, you don't know your name. He and I would occasionally greet each other in Bulgarian. And uh, good day in Bulgarian is Dobra Den. Uh, and he said, that's what I said to Mr. DuPont. And we called in the, the deputy warden, um, uh, oh, uh, Spigarelli, uh, Dominic Spigarelli. And, and Joe and I asked him, is it possible that what you heard was over then? And he laughed, shook his head and said, I know what I heard. That was, uh, <laughs> uh, that was, was then introduced at the competency here. Dennis, I don't know if you recall, I, I should, should have thought of this earlier. At, at one point during a pretrial, uh, Dick Sprague had some kind of surgery on his head. And he appeared in court at the, some of the pretrial litigation, some of the motion years, and he had a big bandage on his head, like a, it was like a turban. And I recall sitting there one day, and I, I, I think it was after you came on, I'm sitting, sitting there watching, you know, DuPont try and act like a lunatic. Sprague with a turban, and I was sitting here wondering what had gone wrong with my life that I was in this setting with a billionaire lunatic and and, and a guy with a turban. But uh, I, I forget what that was. You, did he have a turban on when you were? Well, that actually was before me, but I remember from the transcript that uh, Dick Sprague uh, said, I'm looking over at council table and seeing uh, Mr. McGettigan with that stupid smile on his face. And you, you responded, I don't think I would come in here commenting on other people's looks while you're wearing a turban. So, uh, I, I was not present with that fun. Um, so uh, after uh, DuPont, after the initial uh, competency hearing, uh, was Judge Jenkins said that uh, the, the, uh, the scales weighed ever so slightly, I believe was her phrase, uh, that the defendant is incompetent. And he was sent to Norristown State Hospital. Uh, and uh, so he stayed at Norristown State Hospital for about three months, where at this point, Sprague and, and his uh, uh, Bill Lamb's firms were, um, uh, had been fired. They wound up testifying for DuPont at the incompetency hearing. Um, uh, but, uh, now Tom Bergstrom was in the case, and Tom's a very good trial lawyer, uh, and DuPont was initially determined to be incompetent to stand trial. But in December, we had a subsequent competency hearing, and uh, DuPont was found competent to stand trial uh, uh, because uh, the people at Norristown negotiated with him, essentially, to uh, uh, that they would keep his sister from visiting him. Uh, if he cooperated, which he did, and he presented as competent. He's found competent to stand trial. And then one year to the day after the killing on January 26, 1997, we start jury selection. Jury is picked over the course of, I think, about four days. And then uh, we start presenting our case. And Joe, let me swing it back to you for trial. Um, well, you know, the trial itself was... Uh, not anticlimactic, but uh, I would be remiss if I failed to point out that the pretrial litigation was, to me, in my thinking, in retrospect, 
uh, the most consequential element because DuPont really stood a chance of bail, stood a chance of delaying the trial, uh, and stood a chance of avoiding justice if the pretrial litigation had gone awry. And at the time this occurred in the 90s, I'd been a lawyer for maybe 15 years, and I've been a lawyer now for 40 years. And again, I'd be remiss if I failed to point out that Dennis's performance during the pre-trial litigation aspect was still the most remarkable legal performance I've seen in my life, in my career. Uh, and it, it, it was due to, due to that that we were able to get DuPont's trial. Um, so I, I, I could, can't not say that. It's absolutely true. Um, we, we got to trial. Um, it, Tom Bergstrom, very good trial lawyer. Tom Bergstrom wanted to make the trial just about insanity. He said, well, we'll admit everything that occurred, um, you, you know, that he, that he shot Dave. He said, no, we're going to put this on. The jury needs to know about the horror of what occurred. He would have preferred to make it just a battle of experts, um, completely divorced from the elements of the murder itself in which David Schultz had been brutally executed. Uh, but we, we put that on, that went very well. Um, and, and, and it turned in, in it be a, a battle of the experts. We each put on, uh, they put on three experts, I think, Dennis, I believe. Uh, uh, I think th three or four, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, again, we had Park Dietz, who was a nationally known forensic psychiatrist, and he did a very good job. Dennis saw the need, and, and I agreed, for an additional expert, because sometimes juries just count. So we had John O'Brien, who was local. And also John O'Brien was more um, experienced in committed to and to the impact of DuPont's voluntary use of, of drugs uh, during the course of his bizarre behavior leading up to the murder. I think, Dennis, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and we had, we had a, a pretty fair amount of evidence that it was circumstantial for the most part, but we had a fair amount of evidence that DuPont was a heavy cocaine user. And uh, we were able to introduce that evidence to show an alternative to the paranoia uh, uh, because the, the defense uh, theory was that DuPont was paranoid schizophrenic, which caused him to uh, uh, undertake the killing that he was paranoid of, uh, of Dave Schultz being in league with all kinds of other uh, evil people and were trying to get after him. In fact, we believe DuPont killed him because Dave Schultz was leaving the, uh, the team uh, to compete in the Olympics and wasn't coming back. And Dave Schultz was the glue that held DuPont's Foxcatcher team together. Imagine an American getting standing ovations in Iran and the Soviet Union. Dave Schultz was that loved in the wrestling community. He was known as one of the best technical wrestlers in the world. And at his funeral, it was remarked he had a thousand best friends. Uh, so, uh, but we were able to show that DuPont was a heavy cocaine user and that the defense theory that he was a paranoid schizophrenic uh, really did not, uh, was not uh, neither accurate nor conclusive that uh, his paranoia was a result of drug use, which uh, heavy use of cocaine can cause. And I think we should point out, just for, for, for those who, you know, many who, who uh, are not familiar with the case, DuPont's actual motivation, likely motivation, you never know what goes on inside a murderer's head, for killing David Schultz, who had been a friend to him, were, were the same kind of motivations as drive your commonplace murder, which is anger, hostility. DuPont felt that Schultz was, was betraying, had betrayed him, to others and was going to abandon the estate and DuPont as you'll recall Dennis DuPont believed I mean that he and Foxcatcher were above the law he flew the Foxcatcher flag above the American flag on their flagpole he was a potentate and that someone would not only betray him but then leave his kingdom uh was unforgivable uh that combined with I mean he was obviously mentally ill as well his drug use but a lot of it was just driven by the kind of evil motivation that your standard murderer is, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, uh, you know, so after a month of trial and the competing experts, uh, the, the matter goes to the jury. And uh, that was torture. It was like Groundhog Day because they were out for seven days. Uh, it came back many times for additional instructions on degrees of guilt, murder, uh, uh, diminished capacity, voluntary manslaughter. Uh, Joe and I were very concerned that it could be a voluntary manslaughter decision because voluntary manslaughter includes 
an unreasonable belief in the need for self-defense. And uh, so we were very concerned that that could be the, uh, the verdict. And at the time, I believe the maximum sentence was five to 10 years. So we were concerned about that. Uh, and we, you know, we, and we didn't know if it was going to be a, a straight not guilty for insanity. And so finally, the jury comes back uh, and uh, it was not guilty for first degree murder. And Joe and I are thinking, oh, well, this is, <laughs> could this be a problem? But then they decided guilt of third degree murder, uh, uh, guilty but mentally ill, which then uh, resulted in a sentence by Judge Jenkins of 13 to 30 years. Uh, DuPont uh, then tried to get parole uh, after uh, 13 was denied and died in prison. Uh, and I remember Joe saying he got the life sentence he deserved.